Well, good morning, church. You are the frozen chosen. I am glad you are here. You are encouraging my heart big time as I look into your eyes and see that you are present. So welcome to this first 830 service on this uh, uh, second Sunday of the new year. I'm just really glad you're here and welcome to those who are tuning in online. We're glad that you have connected with us as well. Uh, If you're new, I'm Pastor Josh and it's the new year. So I'm excited genuinely to be with you couple of things, we do have this new service schedule. So we have concluded Saturday nights, at least for the time being, and we are move, have moved to two Sunday morning services, 8.30, obviously you know that you're here, 8.30 and 10.15. Moving forward, that's going to be our pattern, 8.30 a.m., 10.15 a.m. So just get that settled in your psyche, you know, so that you remember that's when the services are moving forward on Sunday mornings. Um, if you are watching online, a couple of things. We are committed to having our worship services online and available for people to worship from a distance. Uh, This is a time of transition. Transitions are always a little bit challenging. And so our goal right now is to get the service online by Sunday afternoons. We would love to live stream, but the internet in the Northwoods is like really intermittent. Has anybody ever experienced that? Um, So uh, we're going to kind of take some steps forward as far as that goes in the weeks and the months to come. But for now, just kind of be patient. We are committed to get the service online. Uh, Our goal is Sunday afternoons for now and hopefully to improve on that in the weeks to come. We have a new sermon series today. It is about friendship, kingdom friendship. And I'm really excited to dig into God's word over the course of these next two months and focus on that and what that means for us in our lives to plant the seed just at the beginning of the mess, uh, the beginning of the sermon, who are your closest friends? Who have they been in the past? Who are they now? Who could they be? I want to encourage you to take inventory of the relationships in your life and even be praying about that as we enter into the beginning of the worship service. A few opportunities for you in the life of our church. There's a senior luncheon This week, Wednesday at noon, if you're 60 and older, this is for you. We'd love to have you. Uh, Please sign up. They want to kind of get a sense of how many are going to be there. In two weeks, January 23rd, we've got our annual church business meeting where we share a little bit more in detail what God's doing in the life of our church. Part of our bylaws uh, require us to have some reports from all our ministry team leaders And the budget that we're going to vote on available two weeks in advance. So those reports are available at the Welcome Center. I really want to encourage you, pick one of those up because it outlines kind of where we're at in our church right now. It shows what our income and our expenses were over the course of this last year. There is a ton to be thankful for. And we really feel the Lord calling us forward to expand ministries. And so you can kind of get a sense of that if you pick up the report and then come uh, and after church, after the 1015 service on Sunday, January 23rd, we're going to have uh, that annual business meeting. Uh, lastly, baptisms. We are going, we fixed the heater in the baptismal, by the way. Um, last time we had baptisms, the heater broke and uh, we had a little bit of a chilly experience. So uh, we fixed that. I think. And uh, we're going to have baptisms January 30th. We already have a couple, three people signed up for that. If you have not responded uh, to the Lord in obedience and been baptized, now could be your opportunity, January 30th. Uh, There are other opportunities to connect in the bulletin. We want to provide ways not to just stay busy, but to connect with other people at a deeper level, to encourage you in your faith. So uh, consider how you may connect this year in that way in this community of faith. All right, I want to open in prayer, but I want to ask you to stand with me for that. Please stand. Our kids, our youth ministry, uh, are away at districts this week, and uh, that includes uh, my twin daughters, Wendy and I's twin daughters, and a number of other people. Uh, This is a massive thing for our youth ministry and for kids to get away and experience this kind of event together with a bunch of kids. So I'm going to pray for that in particular and for our time together. Would you guys bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, thank you today for your presence. Thank you for providing for us in every way. Uh, Lord, help us to see with your eyes in this coming year. 
Help us to see the people around us with your eyes in this coming year. Uh, Lord, in particular, I lift up our youth and Pastor David and the leaders uh, that have gone to this conference as they wake up probably tired this morning from staying up late last night and the fun that they've been having. I pray that you would root them in a sense of who you are, that our youth would walk away from this uh, time more committed to you than ever before in their lives and that you would launch them into this coming year and into the next season of their lives as followers of Christ, excited to know you and follow you. Today, Lord, as we worship you in song, as we worship you in your word, uh, may you just do a work in our hearts and lives that we would be open to and respond. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'd like to begin with a psalm reading again this week. Um, I invite you to read the underlined portions together. This is Psalm 69. Like many of the psalms, it's a psalm of distress, of trouble, of discouragement. Um, David is being very raw in this psalm. We're not going to read the whole thing, but just a few verses. But at the end of it, in the middle of all this distress, he still says that I will praise God in song and glorify him with thanksgiving. And that's hard for us to do sometimes. So our songs are coming from this psalm today. I invite you to read um, the underlined portions as we start today. Um, Psalm 69, David says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there there is is no foothold. I am worn out, calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail, looking Looking for my God. But I pray to you, Lord, in the time of your favor, in your great love, O God, answer me with your sure salvation. Answer Answer me, me, Lord, out of the goodness of your love. In your great mercy, turn to me. I will praise God's name in song and glorify him with thanksgiving. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and all that move in them.
even in times where it's hard to, when things seem uncertain and unstable around us, Lord. Um, we have to remember from your word that you are truly good, full of love, uh, full of grace and mercy for each one of us, and your compassion for us is so deep that we cannot even fathom, Lord. So, Lord, let us continue to sing of your goodness in all things, Lord. Lord, I pray for us as we turn to your word. I pray that you will speak to us. Uh, Lord, I pray for our, um, our ministry teams today as they transition th through some of these changes. Pray that you just allow them the grace they need today um, as they adjust today. And Lord, just ready our hearts now again to, to receive what you have for us from your word. Uh, prepare us now in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may have a seat. Thank you, worship team. Amen. Well, Happy New Year again to you. It is 2022. Because I was off last week, uh, this is my first time in the pulpit this year, and it marks the beginning of this new sermon series entitled Kingdom Friendship. So I'm excited. There is in your bulletin a bookmark that shows what we're going to be focusing on each week over the course of January and February. And I have been thinking a lot about this series for a couple years now. This has been like, I keep track of, uh, prayerfully, of, of sermon series that I feel the Lord calling us to go through. And this has been on the, like, on the list for a couple years. I've been thinking a lot about this for a couple years and about some of the principles within what we're about to study for a couple of decades. In other words, there is really, throughout Scripture, promptings for us to think about friendship, and that's why it's been on my heart, there really is a biblical theology of friendship, meaning that friendship is a whole Bible theme. And the greatest act of friendship history has ever known is Jesus' personal sacrifice for his friends. So better understanding friendship more deeply and biblically by studying Scripture and different examples of friendship helps us better understand Jesus and the overall storyline of the Bible, the overall unified message of Scripture. We could legitimately say that the overall story of the Bible and the good news of the gospel is this. God walked with us in friendship. We walked away. And now he is befriending us again. If you just to sum up the, the good news of the gospel, that's basically it. God walked with us in friendship. We walked away. And he is befriending us again. So over the course of these two months, by looking at different examples in scripture, my hope is that we can take this personally and we can be the community in Christ that God's called us to be, that this would stir us. And the connections it would help us invest in would make a difference for eternity. My hope is that we could take inventory of the relationships in our own lives and in our community. And my prayer is that we would kind of step into this new year like we're stepping into a new season and expecting God to do new things. It's really what I'm hoping. So would you, before we dig in, would you pray with me one more time? Heavenly Father, thank you for each person here this morning. Thank you for our time together to focus on your word and your character and who you are. Thank you for establishing this theme of friendship in the story of your people and the story of who you are and how you've made us. And I pray that that would click with us beginning this week and in the weeks to come. Help us set aside some of the distractions that our minds and hearts can so easily focus on and just be present this morning recognizing your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, if you've got a Bible, please open with me to 1 Samuel 18. Uh, By the way, it's a new year. It's a good reminder to uh, just bring your own Bible. Like, it's so good to see on the pages of Scripture in your own Bible uh, where this text is sometimes when I can't remember the exact reference of a verse. I know, I think it's on like this corner of the page somewhere, you know, and and I, I like getting to know my own my own Bible. So an encouragement to you to do that. If you don't have a Bible, there's Bible, uh, Bibles under the seats. If you don't have a Bible at all, uh, feel free to take that home with you as our gift. First Samuel is the ninth book in, in the Bible. So it's about a quarter of the way into scripture, first Samuel. And we're going to be in chapter 18. Each week we're looking at a different friendship in scripture. This week, in this passage, the kingdom friendship in view is David and Jonathan. And so I just want to read this to kind of open up our time. 1 Samuel 18, 1 to 5. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, in this short passage, we get a really wonderful introduction to friendship, and there's a lot we could focus on. I want to look at three principles that stand out to me about friendship from this passage. The first principle is this. At one level, friendship is about proximity. Again, in verse 1. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. Listen, at one level, the friendship of David and Jonathan was a product of proximity. A little bit of background, and this is brief, but just a little bit of background on David and Jonathan and kind of where we're at in the history of God's people. This is all happening around 1000 B.C., So historians and archaeologists of all different stripes, Christian or not Christian, agree that David lived around 1000 BC and that he eventually became king of Israel. At this point in the account of the Hebrew people, David is not king yet. God had been their king and he had directed them through the words of the prophets. He had led them through the leadership of the judges But the people were looking around them and seeing other nations with kings. They cried out to the the Lord for a king, and God gave him a king. Uh, He gave them King Saul. But Saul wasn't a good king. He was disobedient. He wasn't loyal to God. And so God rejected Saul and instead chose David to succeed him as king. And David, while himself deeply flawed would eventually be called a man after God's own heart. It's interesting, we read Psalms this morning to open up these words of David where he's gut level honest, but eventually always reaches out to trust in the Lord. That's David's heart. He would go on to write a lot of the Psalms and his story, David's story, occupies a huge chunk of scripture. God's promise to David to always be with his household And to have a leader from his household sitting on the throne of Israel, God's promise to David became fulfilled ultimately in Christ. And that's why Jesus in the New Testament is called, one of his titles is, the son of David. But at this point in 1 Samuel 18, David is not yet king. He's a young man. He's growing in his military leadership, his national influence. And yet so is Jonathan. Jonathan is Saul's son. So first of all, apart from any threat regarding their contrasting rights to be king, and we'll get to that. But apart from that, they have a lot of similarities, David and Jonathan. If you go back just a few chapters in 1 Samuel 14, 
There is an awesome story. Uh, it's really actually very engaging of how Jonathan, in my Bible, the, the heading is Jonathan attacks the Philistines. And Jonathan, with just his armor bearer, climbs up a cliff and engages with the enemy and leads uh, the Israelite army to a massive victory. It took courage, it took boldness, it took strength. And so Jonathan shows great courage. He wins a massive victory for Israel. You just move forward just a couple chapters further. And in 1 Samuel 17, there is this epic story of David and Goliath. Where David, similar to Jonathan, shows incredible courage. And it's obviously much more public and it's much more of this iconic story. But it's very similar to Jonathan. He wins this, this battle leading the Israelite army into victory. David and Jonathan have both been trained as warriors. They've both proven themselves. Saul saw how incredible a leader that David was and, it, and invited him into his family. David was given one of Saul's daughters as his wife. David became part of the royal family, if you will, and he, he lived under their roof and he, he ate with them and he was just a part of their family. That's how David and Jonathan initially met. At one level, friendship is about proximity. They just happened to live at the same time in history, in the same culture. They knew the same language, customs, traditions. They were living in the same generation, basically the same age. For many reasons, they were able to be around each other a lot. And so there was this growing familiarity and they learned that they probably learned they just enjoyed being together. And they had probably, I'm guessing, some of this is conjecture, but I'm guessing they had like the same humor. They shared some inside jokes. They looked forward to just being together. They held the same sense of mission and priorities and preferences. And with that connection, they formed a close bond of friendship. That's what verse one means when it says that that Jonathan became one in spirit with David. In the New Living Translation, that same verse is rendered, uh, there was an immediate bond between them. I don't know if you've ever had this before. Uh, I experienced this at college in my freshman and sophomore years when I just graduated high school, the very next year went to college. And I met the guys on my dorm floor that I ended up living with for two years. Uh, Rob and Carl and Mark, guys who I've stayed connected with ever since. We traded Christmas cards just this year and uh, some emails. Uh, we were all engineering students. Uh, we were basically the same age, similar interests, humor, similar drive in life, um, similar character, similar family backgrounds. And it just kind of clicked. And I could tell you stories. And maybe you've experienced this. Maybe you've been lucky enough to experience this, maybe even with people at work or people that you've met through a camp experience or a conference experience. I think of our kids right now, our youth at districts, or maybe friends at school, in grade school, high school, college, graduate school, sports. Maybe even within your extended family, maybe your close family. Maybe with people within your neighborhood. There are just some people who happen to be nearby who sort of get you, right? And you kind of get them. And at one level, at one level, it's about proximity. Maybe I would have met those guys Rob, Carl, and Mark, if I lived on the floor just above them. But we had rooms right next to each other. And they were closest, and we became friends. So as an encouragement to you, at the beginning of this year, in the beginning of this series, I just, I just want to encourage you first, just look around. Just look around you. Who is closest to you? Who do you happen to be living 
next to and around and going through life together, who's in your circle of influence? Because at one level, friendship is about proximity. I read an article this week entitled, Church Small Talk Was More Important Than I Thought, by Megan Hill. She's a a Christian editor and author and wife and a mom of four. And she was talking about her experience in church during the pandemic and how COVID kind of changed the way she interacted with people that she had typically interacted with before. It, it, it changed that and it, it, it hindered it. And there's more distance and the masks and, the, and, and all of that. And she wrote about how there is value in the seemingly casual connections weekly when we gather for worship and community. How there are different categories of friendships and how that's okay. How it's even healthy. How Jesus and the Apostle Paul both knew the joys of various categories of friendship. If we just think about Jesus for a second, uh, in his earthly ministry, Jesus had a particularly close friend in John. And a close friendship with three, Peter, James, and John, and a very committed, uh, ongoing connection with 12, and even a special relationship with 72. Not to mention his family and his community and the multitudes of others with whom he met only briefly. Uh, Hill says something that I think is super important for us at the outset of this whole series on friendship. I mean, I'm going to be encouraging you and challenging you to dig in and to go deeper uh, with the people in your lives. But I think it's really important for us to hear this at the outset. She says this, sometimes in the church, we're quick to emphasize the particularly intimate friendships that grow in small groups, mentoring relationships, or accountability partnerships. These are vital connections indeed. But it would be a mistake to also conclude that just because a relationship isn't close, it isn't important. By demonstrating interest in others' seemingly insignificant matters, we establish the trust to care for them in bigger trials too. I think that's super important for us to hear. Romans 12.15 says to rejoice with those who, who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. Galatians 6.2 says to bear each other's burdens. And those commands are for the big things in life as well as the little things. Um, I have a family member uh, that growing up over the years would only talk about the most serious things. And after a while, you kind of just want to like step back a little bit. Like, I don't know if I can go there right now. And in fact, would not take an interest in, in the things in our lives like just golf or you, she, you, anyways, I, I don't, don't want to go into that, but it's important to dig deep, but it's important to just be with people sometimes, right? And so at one level, before I get too far afield from David and Jonathan, kind of like pulling it back to David and Jonathan, at one level, friendship is first just about proximity, looking around. And so as an encouragement to you, I want to encourage you to look around. Who is closest to you? Learn their names, say hello, invest in them, listen. So that's the first principle. The second is this, at a deeper level, friendship is about commitment. At one level, friendship's about proximity, but at a deeper level, friendship is about commitment. Verse three says, and Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan chose to establish a lasting friendship with David. This is what begins to make this a kingdom friendship. Some aspects of friendships are honestly kind of a fluke or a chance or a happenstance. It's just mere proximity. But at a deeper level, friendship is about commitment. I anticipate during this series leaning a lot into, into this book. It's entitled Made for Friendship. 
Uh, it's by Drew Hunter. Drew Hunter is the teaching pastor at Zionsville Fellowship Church in Indiana. It's a church that Fort Wilderness has a lot of long-term connections with. Uh, Drew and his wife, Christina, and their four little boys were up at Fort a couple years ago when I was the family camp speaker there, and I got to know Drew and his family just over the course of that week. And this is a fantastic book. If you want to jot it down and you want to get it for yourselves, uh, I w you, you won't be disappointed. Made for friendship. And I'm not all the way through it yet because I kind of am soaking it in. Some books you want to read fast. Other books, like, you just kind of want to take it bit by bit. And I'm taking this bit by bit. Uh, and his book is about the importance of friendship. And he says this. Friendship is one of the most familiar yet forgotten relationships of our day. Most people have friends, but few of us know true friendship. Many of us don't know we are missing two of the greatest joys in life, walking with others in true friendship and knowing Jesus as the great friend. And so the goal of his book is about raising our esteem for real friendship so highly that we can't help but pursue it with enthusiasm and joy. That's what I want to do with us. I kind of want to plant that seed and just get you thinking about it, right? Just get you praying about it. Just keep us as a, as a church and a community aware of the rich blessing in our life that friendship is. In John 15, 15, Jesus says, I no longer call you servants. Instead, I have called you friends. Friendship isn't something we've made up. It's something we're made for. And that doesn't just happen with proximity. Throughout the pages of scripture, we find this word covenant. And without getting into the weeds on all that covenant entails, it means promise. It means commitment. And we see that here between David and Jonathan. Verse 3, Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Now, I don't think the takeaway is we need more written contracts between us as friends. Uh, it was kind of important to be very formal for David and Jonathan because they were men of importance in Israel. And without this formal covenant, there could have been a political rivalry between their families, like between the house of Saul and the house of David. Most of us aren't in that kind of situation, so it's probably not going to be quite as formal as it was with David and Jonathan. But at a deeper level, friendship is about commitment. That's biblical. Uh, that's honorable. It's a thing to aspire to. But to an even greater degree, the kind of commitment that is... is lifted up and, and that we see here in this story leads to an even greater reality, which leads us to the third principle. At the deepest level, friendship is about sacrifice. So at one level, friendship is about proximity. At a deeper level, friendship is about commitment. But at the deepest level, friendship is about sacrifice. In verse 4, it says, Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Symbolically and even legally, this was huge. Huge for Jonathan to do. One commentator said this act seems to symbolize the transference to the right to the throne to David. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David. A special robe or a mantle could serve as a symbol of a person's identity and status. Uh, there's a relationship, a friendship that we're going to look at in a few weeks between Elijah and Elisha. And there's a transference of Elijah's robe to Elisha. That's a big deal in that story. Big deal in this story as well. Basically, Jonathan acknowledged David's right to the throne. He didn't fight it. 
He had a sensitivity to the Lord and he recognized it. His actions demonstrated he saw in David a greater man than himself. A man who deserved to lead Israel in the future. And so this was a great sacrifice for Jonathan. But at the deepest level, friendship is about sacrifice. Uh, Another article I read in preparation for this series was entitled The Privilege of Christian Friendships by Pastor Eric Raymond, where he explained that having a friend who is a Christian is a great blessing, but having a Christian friendship is even better. And even though this is an Old Testament story, I think David and Jonathan are a good example of a Christian friendship. Raymond says this, Christian friendships regularly demonstrate forgiveness, kindness, patience, mercy, love, encouragement, grace, prayer, and sacrifice. When you look at a list like this, you immediately realize that three things are required. First, we need more than one person. Second, we need a relationship that's characterized by some level of intimacy. Third, we'll often need some type of challenge to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit in. That we need an opportunity to test the resolve of this relationship. And the rest of the article, he digs into those three things, how we need to be in community. I would remind you at the start of a new year, just be committed to get here regularly. Be committed to get to church regularly, week in and week out. Be committed to gather in this community regularly. We need community. We're made for it. He goes on to establish how we need to be willing to open up with each other. He shares a story about how there was, he was convicted of this years ago and he came to one friend and he just said, listen, we're both followers of Christ, but I think we've been kind of having our friendship at at this level. I I wanna think with you about what it could mean for us to share a little bit more openly and go to the next level. And I was kind of ready for him to either push back or not, but he said, we established a friendship, we moved apart, but we still stay connected. We need to be willing to open up to each other. And and the rest of the article talks about how friendship is never really tested until there's a measure of challenge or conflict or a need to offer forgiveness or ask for forgiveness. This takes some risk and there will be a cost. That sure was the case for Jonathan. It was cost. For us, it won't likely mean a formal relinquishment of political leadership, but definitely we will have to give grace and mercy. We'll have to clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness and gentleness and humility and patience. And it will require our time and likely even our resources. At the deepest level, friendship is about sacrifice. Later in their friendship, when King Saul was literally going mad and out to kill David, Jonathan and David had to come to an agreement that depended on their ultimate trust in one another. That's what 1 Samuel 20 is about. And I I put that on the bookmark uh, for this week. We're not going to dig into 1 Samuel 20 really today. Um, But the whole chapter is an example of risk and sacrifice. It's an example of a sad and complicated family quarrel. It's an example of how that required Uh, the two friends to essentially part ways for the remainder of their lives. But in verse 42, which is the last verse of 1 Samuel 20, uh, it says this, Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left and Jonathan went back to the town. There is in their friendship sacrifice. Christian friendships, kingdom friendships, at the deepest level, they're about sacrifice. 
And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, just early in this new year, may I encourage you, take inventory of your relationships and pursue kingdom friendship, pursue a Christian friendship, rather than simply being okay with acquaintances. This isn't to say that we shouldn't have a variety of friendships. This is good to have a variety of friendships. But our heart should be for more depth. Now, there's kind of a warning with this call. It might require some repentance and prayer and transparency with that brother or sister, but it is worth it. God will richly bless you and your kingdom friendships. My experience is that they are hard to come by. So when you find one, consider yourself blessed and nourish it. Invest in it. Value intentionality and authenticity and even sharing the word of God together. Uh, This week, largely because this series was on my heart and I was preparing for it throughout the week, uh, each day this week, and and it's partly because I came into the new year and you want to like, you know, you got some resolutions and and I'm thinking that way a little bit this week, but but this week, because of the new year and because of this this, uh, emphasis, each day this week, I reached out to connect with three or four people from within this church community and just see how they're doing. People that I would consider uh, friends at a variety of levels. And it kind of culminated in this week and on Friday, reaching out to several guy friends that I would consider some of my closest friends. And I'm just going to tell you that it totally encouraged my heart this week to reach out to these guys and, and connect with them and talk with them a little or text with them or email them. I I called one and he was in the middle of a construction project and the wind was blowing and he was discouraged. And I was like, Hey, I know you can't hear me, but I love you, man. We'll talk to you later. I mean, that was it, you know? And, uh, who knows what the timing is for you to connect with that kind of a friend. And it's been a while but that connection comes like just at the right time, right? God totally uses those things. I want to live with greater depth when it comes to the friendships in my life. And that's going to be more sacrifice than I tend to naturally just think about. At one level, friendship is about proximity. So just look around at the people closest to you. Connect with them. Learn their name. Remember their name. At a deeper level, friendship is about commitment. Be willing to kind of take that next step to maybe invite them over and show some hospitality or join a small group or, or intentionally sit down and have coffee with somebody or lunch. But at the deepest level, friendship is about sacrifice. What could that mean in your life? With your closest friends, could it mean forgiveness? Conversation? Or just simply your presence and listening better. As we dig deeper into what the Bible says about friendship, we're going to see that Jesus is our Savior and He is our King, but He is also our truest friend. And when we press into that, here's what we find the greatest power for becoming a better friend is being befriended by the best friend. So this week, take inventory. First, of your walk with Christ. How close are you to Jesus? When's the last time you just asked him for forgiveness and just said, Lord, I'm sorry. Lead me, guide me, change me. May my life be yours. But also take inventory of your relationships. Pursue kingdom friendship, Christian friendship, rather than simply being okay with acquaintances. You and I were made for friendship In fullness of joy, my prayer for this community is that we pursue that and embrace that. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, on this uh, first day of, for me, 
in the pulpit of this new year in 2022. I thank you for this community. I thank you for the people that you have brought to be um, committed here and part of this uh, ministry and that we get to do life together, that we get to gather week in and week out and see each other and build relationships that begin with just mere proximity, but move to commitment and ultimately sacrifice. Lord, may that be the trajectory of our lives. May we pattern some of who we are after the character of David and Jonathan and their commitment to one another. Who knows what we will see in this coming year, Lord? So prepare us, please. Help us to not uh, waste any time, but to pursue these next steps as you've called us to. We lift all this up to you. and We thank you for the, the, the direction we receive from your presence in your word today. We lift all this up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to close with the song. Please stand.
Hallelujah. Oh, you, oh, you guys just keep going. Sorry. Okay, do it. Keep going. You just keep going. Get, get, get back into it. Do it. Come on. Okay, he says no. All right. Dang it. All right, well, messed that one up. Happy New Year. Um, <laughs> uh, so, a couple of things. Here's what I'm thinking. Take inventory of the relationships in your life, right? Just look around and, and see who is closest to you and, and think of the people you've connected with over the years and be willing to connect again and, and, and check in. Um, a couple of reminders. We have a prayer team down front uh, that can minister to you after you've been scarred by what just happened here. Um, uh, you can take anything to them, a praise, a need, anything. Uh, the things going on this week, uh, we have uh, uh, the senior luncheon. We've got baptism opportunities. There's just ways to connect. Um, but be encouraged and receive this benediction from the end of Romans 16. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with his gospel, Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you this week.